Welcome to this module of the Professor Messer Free A Plus Certification Training Course. And this module is going to focus on the troubleshooting process. Now, this is from the CompTIA certification exam objectives that you can download from CompTIA.org. This is for the 220-601 course, section 1.3, where you have to identify and apply basic diagnostic procedures and troubleshooting techniques. So we're going to go through a little bit of troubleshooting theory. This particular module very focused on lecture, not a lot of practical use of theory, but I've got some things in here that will hopefully give you some insight into the process that you should take when troubleshooting almost anything that you're going to run into. So let's start with the troubleshooting process. These are the five steps as CompTIA has laid them out for troubleshooting. Step number one is you identify the problem. Step number two is analyzing the problem and determining what the the causes of this problem might be. And when you get to step three, you're now ready to start testing. You take the components associated with the problem and test them out. See if you can figure out where the problem's coming from. Once you've done that testing, you should evaluate your results, see if the problem was resolved. And step number five, which is often overlooked, is one where you'll be documenting exactly what you did to solve this problem and what the final outcome of that might be. And that might not be quite as simple as I've put it on this particular slide. This is the troubleshooting process. I've created this flowchart that graphically takes us through everything that we need to know as we step through troubleshooting a particular problem. And we start with when something is broken. What do we do first? Again, identify the problem. Once we've figured out what the problem is, we can start doing more analysis. And this middle section of the screen is where we analyze the problem. We start testing the results of what we found during the analysis phase, and then do an evaluation. And if we haven't fixed the problem, you'll notice that I've got a line here that says it's not fixed yet. We need to go back to the analysis phase so that we can actually fix the issue. If it is fixed and we actually have it working, we then go to this bottom line where we document the process and finally affix this particular issue. So let's start with this first process of the troubleshooting theory of identifying the problem. And that's this, this very top first step. Once we have identified that something's not working, let's really figure out what isn't working by identifying. And then this entire process is really about gathering information. The information gathering process really deals mostly with asking questions and trying to determine what somebody happens to be seeing. After all, most of the times when you're working in an environment, it's not you having the problem. Somebody else is frustrated by the problems that they're having. So you're trying to figure out what the nature of the problem might be, if there's a specific error message that's coming up on the screen. And that's oftentimes a challenge for us technically because we want to know exactly what it's saying. But oftentimes, the end user doesn't know the exact error message. They, they didn't write it down. And they might not know exactly the words that were there. Maybe they were remember two or three of the words. And that's your challenge as a technician is to determine what exactly this problem might be caused by. So these are clues that you're going to get. And oftentimes, you're going to be really asking questions. Were there changes made to the computer? Was there a history that we can go back on? Were you having this problem before? Did it happen last month? Oh, you, you had this problem six months ago. And maybe you can go back to your documentation that you have with your help desk and determine what was done at that time with this particular problem. Logs can also be a very good place to go. These are logs that are on the computer itself. The Windows Event Viewer, and as we go through this training course, we'll be diving into exactly how to look through these logs. I'm just putting them on this particular slide for reference. There's also event logs that are often created by the applications themselves. If you get a very smart app, it might save its own little error log out to the hard drive. Sometimes that's a nice place to go to find out more information about the problem. There are also event logs that you're going to find in the basic input output output system of the computer itself, or the BIOS as we call it. So make sure you take advantage of all of these different resources. It's not just about asking questions of the end user. Oftentimes, you can get a lot of information from the computer system itself. 
Now that we've gone through the identification of these problems, let's try to do some analysis now of where these particular problems might be caused. And this is this first box in the middle. Once we've identified, we're going to start stepping through potential problems of this. And most times, you're going to start with whether the problem is a software problem or a hardware problem. You're going to need to make this determination. It's not always very obvious. Sometimes it is a software error that pops up. But it's a software error that's caused by something going wrong with the hardware itself. You'll see that a lot with memory type problems. Or maybe the problem is hardware related. You get an error when you start up the computer, and it tells you right away, I'm having problems with the memory. It won't even start the operating system. And that helps you understand whether this problem happens to be hardware or software related, because that's going to determine what you're going to do next. Now, once you have identified the problem itself, you have a pretty good idea what is going on, you want to write down or at least list out all the possible causes. Well, if I'm getting an error with this, it might be the memory. It might be the application that's running. It might be a driver associated with perhaps a scanner that's used by this imaging application that's having a problem. And you need to set expectations with the end user and let them know that this problem is very cut and dry. It's something we should be able to resolve easily. Maybe it's something that's very complex. We may have to go through a number of steps to troubleshoot this. It may take a number of days. And as long as your end user understands that and you've set the proper expectations with them, they're oftentimes going to help you through that process so that, that you can resolve the issue for them. You should also plan for contingencies. And what I mean by that is if you think this problem is being caused by hardware, but you're going to start troubleshooting on the software, you might want to go ahead and order the additional hardware right now. Oftentimes, these systems are very, very important. I was working in a police department with their system that provided them with DNA evidence. And when they had a problem with it, they, they called me on the phone and said, we're having this problem. When I showed up at that place, I had everything that I would ever possibly need, almost one of everything inside of that system, so that I could swap out every piece of hardware associated with that, a very important computer. And we needed they, they needed to make sure that system was running. In the end, it was just memory. And I not only brought memory with me, I brought twice as much memory to make sure that that very important DNA system was up and running as quickly as possible. So make sure that if there are possibilities that you've set yourself up to make sure that you can solve this problem as quickly as possible. Now that you've identified what this problem might be, it's time to do some testing. And the part that we're going to do is test the components related to this particular problem that we're having. You obviously don't need to test everything in the computer, at least not initially. And the first part that most people will do, in fact, is before you even do any type of really formal testing, is a visual inspection. You will be surprised as you start troubleshooting systems how often it's a loose cable, how often it is a card, an interface card, that has popped out of the motherboard that needs to be pushed down just a little bit. And you'll find that you make one small move click, it goes right into the motherboard, and you've solved the problem. These systems are being turned on. They're being turned off. They're getting hot. They're getting cold. There are fans running in them, so they're vibrating a little bit. Oftentimes, these things will pop open. And just by looking into the system, you may find the problem that you happen to have. These connections that you'll want to check, oftentimes, you'll even after the visual inspection, you'll push on every single possible connection just to make sure it's seated really well in there. Oftentimes, when you're testing, you're also going to go through looking at configurations, not just of the software that's having a problem, but maybe the hardware of the system itself. If somebody's having a problem using a USB port on the back of a computer, one of the things you might want to look at is make sure that that USB port is enabled in the hardware configuration of the computer. Because if it isn't, there's no way for the software to use it. Oftentimes, you'll see that in the device manager in your operating system that gives you a list of all of the different pieces of hardware and software that might be loaded, that device manager oftentimes gives you a feel of whether that particular component is even working or not. Sometimes even has a nice troubleshooter there so you can step through the different phases of troubleshooting the particular component that you're interested in. I will oftentimes have the vendor's websites already available in my bookmarks. But that's a great place to go is out to the internet and look through those pieces. As I was setting up for this training course, I was having problems with the audio recorder that I use. I went out to the vendor's website, and it gave me some ideas of where my problems might be. So it was a great resource to have available. Pulled up a PDF of my audio recorder, and I was able to see that immediately. 
So now that you've done some investigation, you've done some testing, and hopefully tried a few different things, reseated some interface cards, or you've made sure that cables were connected, now you need to see, did that fix the problem? We need to evaluate this and see if the problem that we had is now working. Now, one of the things that you'll find as you go through this troubleshooting process is often these questions that you have, is this hardware or software, oftentimes lead you down a path of asking even more questions. Is it memory related? Well, what kind of memory is in the system? Where is it located in the motherboard? Do, should I get additional memory? Should I swap it out with another system that I know to be working? And so those questions will lead you down a road of that troubleshooting process. You may have to take additional steps here. Oftentimes, there may be another technician in the room you may ask them, have you ever seen this particular problem on this particular model, something that you may not have seen before? Use some al uh, alternative resources as well. Out on the internet are a number of of websites that are not run by the vendors, but they're run by enthusiasts, just like you and I, that just keep track of weird little problems like this. Some of those websites are great for determining these really interesting problems that you can't seem to find information on anywhere else. And believe it or not, I even looked through the manuals. And oftentimes, you'll find these little nuggets of information in a book that is written down that tells you, are you having this problem? It's probably related to this issue. And maybe if it's not a word-for-word -word problem of what you're having, it may spark some interest in your mind of looking at components that are very similar to the types of problems that you'll find written up in the manuals. Now, if the problem still isn't resolved, you're going to have to go back to the process of trying to understand more about what the problem could be. And you're going to find it. That's what's nice about this whole troubleshooting process. Beginning to end, you're going to figure out what the problem is because you keep going through that same theory of troubleshooting over and over again until the problem's resolved. Now, once you've identified the problem, you've resolved it, you've tested it, and yes, you reseeded that particular interface card, and now the system appears to be working exactly as I would expect, it's good to document this particular uh, the particular results that you had. And you can see this, this whole outcome is the very last thing that you'll need to do. And make sure you don't skip this. Very often, this is something that people just ignore. But you're going to find the better documentation you have, the better it's going to serve you into the future. This is valuable knowledge that you just discovered during this troubleshooting process. And whether it's something that you document for your internal purposes, or even better, you're documenting it for other people to see out on the internet so they can search for the particular error and find it, you're going to be helping other people in the industry who have this particular kind of need for that knowledge. And this is a really great idea to create a knowledge base. Have all of these types of problems for this particular application and start building on it. Have this great resource to go to whenever you have a type of problem with this particular application or this particular piece of hardware. You may find that just by creating the knowledge base, you've become the expert for this particular piece of technology. People may be coming to you to figure out more later on about how to solve these problems. And you now have an entire knowledge base that you can pull from. Now, if you start looking at this over the long term, you may find you get some really unique insight into what you have. And I wrote down one that's really intriguing to me that Google did. Now, you can imagine Google has thousands and thousands and thousands of servers. And inside of every single one of those servers is a hard drive oftentimes many hard drives. And one of the things that Google found in their research is what are the trends for hard drive failure? Is it random? Is there a test that you can do to watch for? Is it temperature related? And they did this great study of how their hard drives performed across all of their different data centers. So I've got this PDF that's listed here. You can Google for failure trends in a large drive population, or just follow the link that I have here on the screen at research.google.com. It really is this, this document itself, very easy to read. They wrote it in a way that you can understand. They have great graphs in there. It's very interesting, the results they came up with, results that they would have never had if they didn't document the outcome whenever they had a drive failure. Very interesting things to see, and certainly speaks to the value of having that documentation available. So there's our troubleshooting process from beginning to end, from the time that it's broken, identifying the problem, 
analyzing the problem, figuring out where the causes might be, testing our theories on where this problem might be coming from, and seeing if we were able to resolve the issue, and ultimately making sure that we documented it for the future. That troubleshooting process will serve you greatly into the future. For more free a certification resources, including message boards and study guides, be sure to visit our website, freeaplus.com.